If you would turn in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 22. You know, a lot of times when people are skeptical about the Bible or about God, they'll usually pick on a particular subject or a particular instance or maybe come up with a particular scenario that they hope will be that thing that stumps the Christian and makes them where, well, you don't have an answer for me. You can't, you can't tell me why this is so or you can't explain this um, seemingly contradictory situation in Scripture. And I believe that sometimes people do that on purpose. Just to see if they can make a point. You know. They want to win a debate or an argument. And, and I want to tell you, as many times as I've been in those conversations, here's one thing I have come to realize. The Lord Jesus did not give me this blessed word to win an argument or a debate. He gave me this word to just submerge myself in it so that I can live a life that's glorifying to Him and that I can show love to other people. And I'm not trying to win a debate or an argument when I tell somebody about Jesus. I'm trying to win their soul to glory. And it, it, it makes no difference to me if they think I'm stupid or if they believe uh, that I'm wrong or if they don't believe what I'm telling them about Jesus because it's not my responsibility to convert their hearts or change their mind. My responsibility is to be obedient and tell them about Jesus and love them. And as long as I've done that, I have been successful in my evangelistic encounter. We need to almost redefine what a win is, right? What's it mean to win? What's it mean to be successful when it comes to evangelism and sharing the gospel? How does that affect us and our willingness to share? So we're going to read this morning from Matthew chapter 22, beginning in verse 23. And I have attach this title to this message and I'm not sure if it's all that appropriate but it seemed like a good idea at the time pride comes before a fall because the more I read the more I saw the pride of the religious leaders and their uh, I don't know their unwillingness to just know when they've they've met their match Matthew 22, starting in verse 23. Here's what the Bible says. On that day, some Sadducees, who say there's no resurrection, came to Jesus and questioned Him, saying, Teacher, Moses said, If a man dies having no children, his brother, as next of kin, shall marry his wife and raise up children for his brother. Now there were seven brothers among us, and the first married and died, And having no children, he left his wife to his brother. It was the same also with the second brother and the third, down to the seventh. Last of all, the woman died. In the resurrection, therefore, whose wife of the seven will she be? For they all had her in marriage. You see, I'm going to just pause right there. Isn't that the most nonsensical thing you've ever heard? That's the kind of questions people come up with when they're trying to trip up Jesus or trip up a Christian. Verse 29. But Jesus answered and said to them, You're mistaken, since you do not understand the Scriptures nor the power of God. For in the resurrection they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are like angels in heaven. But regarding the resurrection of the dead, have you not read what what was spoken to you by God? I am the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. He is not the God of the dead, but of the living. When the crowds heard this, they were astonished at His teaching. But when the Pharisees heard that Jesus had silenced the Sadducees, they gathered together. And one of them, a lawyer, asked Him a question, testing Him. Teacher, which is the great commandment in the law? And He said to him, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your uh, mind. 
This is the great and foremost commandment. The second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Upon these two commandments hang the whole law and the prophets. Now while the Pharisees were gathered together, Jesus asked them a question. What do you think about the Christ? Whose son is he? And they said to him, the son of David. And he said to them, then how does David in the spirit call him Lord? Saying, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I put your enemies under your feet. Therefore, if David calls him Lord, how is he his son? No one was able to offer him a word in answer. Nor did anyone dare from that day on to ask him any more questions. Father, I pray in Jesus' name that you take this word, that you would illuminate our minds, give us understanding, and I pray you'll help us to do what you tell us to do and to honor you with this life you've given us. Lord, please, please speak to us clearly today. Open our hearts and minds. Please, Lord, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. I want to just walk through some truth in this passage today, and I'll try to be as detailed as I can in, in a short amount of time. But some of these things may seem maybe self-evident or maybe like a foregone conclusion, but I felt like we need to see the truth that God presents to us in His Word today, uh, if for no other reason just to re-emphasize things that we may already know. The first one is this. Testing Jesus and His Word is stupid. I, I, just, I, I, I tried to wordsmith this thing and come up with a nice point for this first part here, and I just couldn't come up with anything better than that. I did have silly. I did say silly, but I said, you know, silly's not strong enough. I think it's stupid. Testing Jesus in His Word is stupid, but here's the irony of it all. The people who would test Jesus in His Word are convinced they're the smartest people in the room. Isn't that interesting? Am I the only one getting fired up here? I must be. On that day, the Bible says, verse 23, on that day, this is the same day that the Pharisees had just attempted to trap Jesus in the previous paragraph. So you look back at verse 15 to 22, you'll see an account two weeks ago, we looked at that, when the Pharisees were trying to trap Jesus in his words, and they failed, of course. But it was on that same day, this other group, the Sadducees, who, by the way, it's pointed out in verse 23, do not believe that there is a resurrection at all. Okay, that's important. Because why on earth would a group that does not believe that there is any such thing as resurrection come to Jesus with this contrived story asking him about the resurrection? They don't even believe in it. Kind of like the folks who are mad as they can be at God, but they don't believe God exists. Isn't that interesting? You're going to be mad at something that you don't believe in. Okay. I'll let you just worry about how silly that is. Moses said, Moses said, they asked Jesus, Moses said, this is what happens when uh, a man and a wife are married, they have no children, and the man dies. This is what's supposed to happen. So what they're doing is they're quoting, by the way, side note, if you like to take notes, you might want to mention this, the Sadducees were all about the Torah. Okay, that means the first five books of the Bible, first five books of the Old Testament, the Law of Moses, as it's called. They were all about those five books as the authority. They didn't really pay a whole lot of attention to the prophets and the other parts of the Old Testament, which are equally God's Word, equally authoritative, but they clung to those first five books, right? So what does Jesus do? He attacks them from the first five books. I love how he does that. So they're quoting Deuteronomy 25, verse 5, on down to about verse 10, the Leveret marriage law. Okay, that's what they're, they're coming to him from there. So they say, Moses said this, and then they add this nonsensical hypothetical about the man dies with no children, but he has six brothers, and each brother subsequently marries his wife and dies. At this point, I'd be kind of looking at the wife. Like, she kills seven men, and nobody's saying a word about that. You know, what's going on here? That would have been my first question. 
Finally, the woman dies, last of all, still no children. And they want to know, well, whose wife is she going to be in the resurrection? You know, that resurrection they don't believe in. Whose wife is she going to be? I want to just give you, I'm going to quote a few different people here throughout this and try to, try to be uh, concise, but David Turner said, the Sadducees are not sincerely inquiring about religious truth, but they're seeking to trap Jesus and discredit his teaching. And this caricature of circumstance that the Sadducees story uh, shows, that it's meant to ridicule the idea of life after death. That's all they're trying to do. And, and isn't this usually the case when folks who don't believe in God or the Bible, they're not really seeking information. They don't come from a genuine curiosity that they want to know an answer. They just want to see if they can make fun of it. Right? That's, that's really what's going on. So, we get to the second point when Jesus is about to answer, and that is this. The more you understand Scripture, the less questions you have. The fewer questions you have. The more you understand Scripture, the fewer questions you have. Side note, how do you understand Scripture? You've got to start with reading it. You start with reading it, and then you pray and say, Lord, help me understand this. And crazy thing happens after that. If you're honestly seeking the Lord and His truth, and you read the Bible, and you ask Him to give you understanding, guess what He does? He, he gives you understanding. It's funny how He does that. Jesus answers very directly. I love this in verse 29. You're mistaken. You're wrong. And then he proceeds to explain why you're mistaken. He says two things. He says, first of all, you don't understand the Scriptures. And second of all, you don't understand the power of God. They don't understand the Scriptures because they don't believe in the resurrection. They don't understand the power of God because they don't understand that the same God who spoke creation into existence can pretty much do what He wants to do. Right? I don't think there's anything too impossible or too difficult for God to accomplish, right? Can we agree on that? You know, he, he, he created everything that exists. I'm pretty sure he can handle this question, right? Leon Mars said, it's one thing, this is so good, this is so timely. It's one thing to be able to quote passages that you think support your preconceived position, but it's quite another to understand and follow the teaching of the Bible. To understand and to yield oneself to what Scripture says is quite different from quoting passages the way the Sadducees were doing. And just as they do not really understand Scripture, they do not know the power of God. So Jesus explains their error. They neither marry nor are given in marriage in the resurrection. They're like angels in heaven. Now, this is important. They are not angels. They are like angels in the sense that they don't marry and they are not given in marriage. So please don't misunderstand. I, this is one of my personal pet peeves, and I'm going to share it with you, and I hope it doesn't hurt your feelings. But if it does, okay, never mind. So here, here's what it is. When we die, we don't become angels. Okay, let me just settle that. If you want me to show it to you in Scripture, I'll be happy to. But here's, here's the, the problem I have. A lot of times, this is a, a downfall of social media. You get information all the time, maybe lots of times more than you want. And here's what I see. When friends of mine have lo lost a loved one and they say, well, heaven gained an angel. No, they didn't. No, they didn't. Heaven didn't gain an angel. Did you know that if you were to become an angel when you died, you would take a step down from what God has created you to be? You are a unique beautiful, glorious creation of Almighty God. You are not an angel. You are the crowning achievement of His creation. And we would take a step back to become an angel. So I just want to throw that in there. That's extra. Um, no charge. So here's what is happening. These Sadducees have presented this extreme example of the contradictions they believe this law of marriage present for the idea of resurrection. So Jesus proceeds to refute them, and he quotes, as I said, something from the Torah. Exodus chapter 3 and verse 6. You know what that is? Exodus chapter 3 and verse 6. It's a little story about Moses at the burning bush. You know what happened at, at the burning bush? God spoke to him out of the fire, right? Remember what he said? 
I am the God of Abraham. I am the God of Isaac. I am the God of Jacob. And you know what that means? He didn't say I was. He said I am. Present tense. Well, Abraham and Isaac and Jacob were all dead at this point. You see where I'm going? He's not the God of the dead. He's the God of the living. It's exactly what Jesus explains here. And so there must be resurrection because God is the God of the living, not the dead. And so he explains that to them uh, very clearly. And so what is their response? Because, you know, if they're the smartest people in the room, surely they'd have a comeback, right? No. It says they were silenced. You know how we know that? Verse 34, the next... The next uh, section, the Pharisees, oh, they saw that Jesus had silenced the Sadducees with his answer. So they had no response. And not only that, look at verse 33, the reaction of the crowds. They were astonished. So even if the Sadducees didn't want to believe what was happening to them, everybody that was watching and listening were like, oh, you just got burned. Right? Right? So they're all astonished because they get it. They heard what Jesus said. They know what it means. Oh, well now, when the Sadducees, they got nothing to say. Maybe they're not as smart as they think they are. Number three, learn from your mistakes. Learn from your mistakes. When you see that in verse 34 and following on down, this is when the Pharisees now insert themselves back into the, the equation and they gather together after they hear about Jesus silencing the Sadducees. And this one Pharisee who happened to be a lawyer, and by the way, this may be, I'm not positive, this might be where this, this idea of lawyers being bad comes from, right here. It, it might be. Because this guy does them no favors as far as an occupation is concerned. The lawyer who was also a Pharisee, you know what that means? So how, how educated was this man? You know what a Pharisee's education looks like? They know the Old Testament backward and forward and upside down, every which way. They know the Old Testament, much of it by memory, but they know it very well. And he's a lawyer on top of that, so that means he's gone to additional schooling to have a, a trade where it's much more... Um, studying involved. So he's a very learned man. He's very educated. And he says in verse 36, Teacher, which is the great commandment in the law? Now, you know why that's interesting? Yeah, I mean, we think about ten commandments, right? Ten commandments, Exodus chapter 20. You know how many commandments were in Jewish law? 613. 613, and this brother's going to ask him which one's the greatest. So you see what he's doing, right? There's always a motive. There's always a motive. Hey, Jesus, I know there's only 613 laws here. Which one's the most important? So he's bound to get it wrong, right? That's what the lawyer's thinking. He's bound to mess this up. There's 613 commandments. Tell me which one's the best. And Jesus replies with two. He starts off with Deuteronomy chapter 6 and verse 5. This comes from what is known to Jewish circles as the Shema. This is the Lord our God, the Lord is one. One God. And then he says in verse 5, Deuteronomy 6 verse 5, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. Right? Then, he switches over to Leviticus chapter 19 and verse 18. Leviticus 19, 18 tells us we should love our, love our neighbor as ourself. So what, what do these two things have in common? Love. What is the primary ingredient on which, by the way, hang the entire law and the prophets? These two commandments. Love. Everybody, anybody got a bulletin? Look at the front of your bulletin. This is our mission. 
This is our mission as a church. There's three things right across the top. Three symbols, three statements. What are the first two? Love God. Love people. Make disciples. This right here. This is, this is why we exist as a church. The great commandment and the great commission. You love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. You love your neighbor as yourself. You make disciples of all nations. That's why we exist as a church. Every other thing we do comes from these things. You want to see if you're being obedient to God? All right, here's an easy check. How are you loving God? How are you loving others? How are you making disciples? That's a quick inventory of, am I following God? Am I doing what He's called me to do? There's plenty of other specific things you can add into that, but at the base, foundational level, are we loving God? Are we loving one another? Are we leading people to Jesus and helping them grow in their relationship with Him? That's the most important and primary thing. The whole law and the prophets completely depend on these commands. So Craig Blomberg said that love is the heart of both the law and the gospel, despite other differences between them. Jesus has answered his questioners with the most profound reply anyone could have given. Are you loving God? Are you loving people? And so the Pharisees have not learned from their mistakes of questioning Jesus because once this lawyer opens his mouth and thinks he's done one up on Jesus and tried to trap him in the vast library of 613 commandments and he just comes right back. Love God. That's in Deuteronomy. Love your neighbor. That's in Leviticus. Because you're supposed to know the Old Testament, right? You're a Pharisee. You're educated. You know what else Jesus tends to ask people who question Him? Have you not read? Do you not know? In other words, have you been reading your Bible? Because you should be reading your Bible. Why is it so important that we read our Bible? How else are we going to know anything that God requires of us you want to live a life holy and pleasing to the lord what's that look like how are you supposed to figure that out it's not a guessing game it's not a maze god doesn't just throw these commands at us all willy-nilly and say oh well i hope you get that right he get, he asks the question and gives us the answer isn't that isn't that loving he tells us what He wants us to do. So the last thing is this. Number four, learn to practice humility. And I suppose this is where the title of the message came from. Pride comes before a fall. We have to learn to practice humility because these Pharisees, these Sadducees, these religious leaders, all of them, the whole lot, they all share one, of all their differences, they share one thing in common. They're super arrogant. They're really proud of who they are. And they're really convinced that they know more than everybody else. And they're not afraid to say that. And if they don't say it outright, their actions demonstrate. Right? They go up to Jesus... And they continually try and come up with these questions and these uh, scenarios that are going to trap him in his answers and, and get him to where he's at odds with this group or that group. And something's going to go wrong with what, what he says to where they can point and say, Oh, I got gotcha, you! Right there. And every single time, they fail. Right? They're asking Jesus about the words that he inspired he wrote you ever met like if you you have a favorite book 
or I mean, I look at Caitlin, she's like, oh, how long do you have? I've got like 100 favorite books. That's all she does is read. But what would, what would you do if you met the author of a book you read that you just really, really love? Would you go up to that person and try to quiz them about their knowledge of the book they wrote, expecting to give them some epiphany like they didn't think of that? Right? It's their book. They wrote it. Of course they know it better than anybody else. And yet, here we have these religious leaders, time and time again, trying to catch Jesus in an answer about the word that he himself wrote. Learn to practice humility. So Jesus finally questions them uh, in response to their questions. Verse 41 they're all gathered together, so Jesus questions them. He says, what do you think about this Messiah? Whose son is the Messiah? And they answer pretty quickly, right? Because it's in the Bible, right? They respond saying that the Christ is the son of David. So now Jesus, this is so, so great. Jesus causes the Pharisees to question their own beliefs. Right? The Bible says that he quotes to them, by the way, this is the most quoted Old Testament verse. Psalm 110, verse 1, is the verse that Jesus quotes. And that is the one Old Testament verse that is most often quoted in the New Testament. And Jesus uses it right here. And he says, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand until I put your enemies under your feet. And then in verse 45, if David calls him Lord, how is he his son? When I was in seminary, I had to take a, a class in philosophy. And it was a, a pretty interesting class. But let me tell you the one thing, I learned all kind of stuff in philosophy about objective, clear thinking, illogical thinking, and all these things. But you, you know what I learned first day of class? Don't say anything. If the professor asks a question, just sit there and act like you're thinking. Uh, but don't say anything. You know why? Because in a class of 25 uh, prospective preachers, guess what there always is? There's at least one person in there who thinks they know more than everybody, and they're going to be quick to speak up. And guess what happens when you speak up in a philosophy class? The, the philosophy professor embarrasses you in front of everybody else in the class because he reveals to you how little you really know. And so once the first person says something, you just sit there and be quiet and laugh because it ain't you, right? So I had one of those. In fact, he was sitting like two seats over from me. And like the guy asked a question and he immediately shot out this answer. I was like, oh boy, you shouldn't have done that. And uh, sure enough, uh, the next five minutes was spent everybody looking at him and kind of smiling and laughing because, it's like, man, I'm glad I didn't say anything. The Pharisees and the Sadducees and all the religious leaders, they never really learned their lesson. They always thought they were smarter. They were never very humble. They always thought they knew more than everybody else, even Jesus. And so at this point, the Bible says that once again he had silenced everyone who was attempting to trap him or trick him or ask him all these questions. No one was able to offer him a word in answer. And look at the final part of verse 46. From that day on, no one dared ask him any more questions. And that's good and bad. Because you know what that means when the questions are all over? It means they're fed up, they're tired of being embarrassed, so they just go to the next part of their plan. And their next part of their plan is, well, if we can't outsmart him, I guess we'll just kill him. And that's what they did. This is the final week of Jesus. The next chapter, next Sunday, the entire chapter, chapter 23, is Jesus 
pronouncing all the woes on the Pharisees. This is who you think you are. This is who you are. This is why you're not going to heaven unless you change course. This is it. And he just spends 39 verses railing against them, demonstrating all their problems. And you know what happens after chapter 24? The plot. The plot to kill Jesus unfolds. It starts with a supper. Goes to the garden. It ends with arrest, trial, torture, and death. See, that's what happens when people don't trust in God and His Word. Eventually, they don't get their questions answered to their satisfaction, so they just go to a different tactic. This interrogation scene during this final week of the life of Christ has finally come to an end. Let me read just a couple of statements from Leon Morris and then we'll be done. So Jesus was now more admired when they finished their questions than when they started. They were trying to discredit him and they failed miserably. So it's no surprise that finding they could not answer the question he had put to them, none of them dared any more to question him. This was a game in which they thought they held all the advantages. After all, how could this layman from rural Galilee compete with the professionals who had been through the schools in Jerusalem? But in the end, they had been defeated. You know, and all the questions stop. The real irony is this. Those religious leaders, they really did not know how badly they had been defeated. They thought they had just lost this debate. What they didn't understand is the Messiah sent by God to redeem mankind was standing right in front of them. The one person to whom the entire Old Testament points. He was right there. And rather than humble themselves and listen, they got all up in their feelings and got arrogant and were determined to come out on top of the argument. When they could have been forgiven they could have been covered with that blood that was about to be shed just two days later but instead they just swelled up with pride kept asking their questions and ended up on the wrong side of biblical history so what are we supposed to learn from that how are we supposed to apply all those things? I mean, that's a lot of back and forth, a lot of details, a lot of questions and answers and disagreements. So how do we take that and apply it to our lives? Very simply, it's like this. There will come a time in our lives, many of us have already been there, when we'll realize that Whatever pathway we've been taking up to this point has not gotten us anywhere except in more and more trouble. We'll realize that pride and arrogance is not the answer. We'll realize that we just simply don't have all the answers to our questions that, that we try to find in this world. And it's at that point when we finally get to a point of humbling ourselves and realizing that we're not all we're cracked up to be and we need somebody outside of ourselves to fix our problems, Jesus is standing right there, waiting. He's not very intrusive. 
He's not going to be the one who, who busts down your door and beats you over the head with His truth. He's going to be standing there much like this with His arms open trying to show you and tell you how much He wants to love you. You know, you know why His arms are open like this? Two reasons. One, He probably wants to give you a big hug. But two, because He just came off of that cross. He's trying to show you the distance He will go to love you and to forgive you. That's, that's the, the end game. It's not to, not to answer all your questions. It's not to satisfy your intellectual curiosity, although He could do that. It's to, to show you by His actions how much He loves you, how much He's done to draw you back to Himself and to re restore that relationship that was broken by sin. That's really all He wants. He wants you to understand without Him you have nothing and with Him you have everything. It's, it's all really in a math equation. Ready? It's so simple it'll blow your mind. Jesus plus nothing equals everything. Let's pray.